know, at that point, Luke and Ferdinand, they didn't give God the credit for what had happened in that moment. Very much so, God was involved in bringing that man down that road at that time to meet with those two boys. And then so much the way that it is in life sometimes, don't we? Where God does something and we get our focus on the something that he does instead of on him. And um, so Luke and Ferdinand, they missed it. They didn't give God the glory for what God had done. Instead of uh, seeing him, they saw the things that he did. And so this morning, the adults, we're going to be talking about that um, as we think about Thanksgiving. Uh, kids can be dismissed at this time because of class. And um, thanks for joining in the store. That's going to be dismissed. We're going to take a break from the book of Acts this week. And we're going to be in the book of Luke. Same author, different book. We're going to be in Luke chapter 17. If you have your Bible, I encourage you to follow along. If you don't have your Bible, you could look at uh, look for one under a seat in front of you. We're going to be in Luke chapter 17. The title of this message, The One Who Returned. If I were to give you a, a key phrase this morning or a primary proposition, what I'm trying to communicate, it would be that we need Jesus. We need his healing uh, spiritually speaking. And in this story, we see ten lepers. And um, context here, Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. He's in his last month of ministry. He was fasting between Samaria and Galilee, and um, he's been, at this point in his ministry in Luke 17, he's been making his way towards Jerusalem, and uh, he, as he makes his way towards Jerusalem, the end of his life, he is doing so, uh, ministering along the way. He does a few miracles here and there, and um, this section of his ministry, there's a lot more teaching that is involved, and so when he does a miracle, it is in close connection with teaching. And uh, so um, miracles become more and more profound as they're not only a display of his authority and his power, but uh, here we learn about um, this, uh, what we can observe from this miracle. There is a, uh, a profound lesson in this story in Luke chapter 17. And so we're going to be in um, verse 11, and we're going to make our way through verse uh, 19. And uh, I'll begin reading in verse 11, and then after we read this, uh, this passage, we'll pray together. It says, While he was on the way to Jerusalem, he was passing between Samaria and Galilee. As he entered a village, ten leprous men who stood at a distance met him. And they raised their voices, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they were going, they were cleansed. Now one of them, when he saw that he had been healed, he turned back, glorifying God with a loud voice. And he fell on his face at his feet, giving thanks to him. And he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus answered and said, Were there not ten cleansed? But the nine, where are they? Was no one found to return to give glory to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, Stand up and go. Your faith has made you well. That is our text this morning. Let's pray together. Father, we are grateful, not only for the things that you have done, but we are grateful for who you are. This morning, I pray that you would use this text to challenge our hearts in the way that we think about gratitude. I pray that you would um, help us to better position ourselves before you in worship and understanding of who you are. I pray that this morning you would uh, work in us, um, allow your word to do what it alone has the ability to do in challenging our hearts and bringing about conviction. I pray that you would help me as I speak this morning, help me to say the things that you would want me to say, help me not to say anything that would 
be distracting from the truth of your word. Father, I pray that the result of this morning as we study your word, the way that we handle it, the way that we study it, the way that we apply it, I pray that the result will be worship. We know that you alone are worthy of our praise. You alone are worthy of, of all glory. Father, help us this morning to to give you the glory. Thank you for your grace, for your mercy, and letting us have the opportunity to study your word. Thank you for your love this morning. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. First thing that we see this morning is these sinful outcasts, these um, leprous men. Um, so, uh, point number one, the sinful outcasts, and what you're going to see here is not, not just a story about men who are healed physically, but I believe what you see here is a picture of what happens at the point of salvation. This one who comes back to Jesus recognizes who he is as God and worships him. And so, what we see in this beginning is these, these leprous men um, really demonstrates the, uh, the yuck of sin. Can I phrase it that way? Um, he entered this village, these ten leprous men, they stood at a distance to meet him. They apparently had heard of Jesus. They knew who he was. There was some kind of a association um, with uh, understanding his ministry. And we see here, this is not, um, this is not the first time that Jesus has dealt with uh, leprous, leprous people, right? Uh, in Luke chapter 5, he also heals a leper. There it's done differently than it's done here. He touches that leprous man here. He just speaks to these uh, lepers. And the um, question is, what is a leper? Uh, the word leprosy, it means um, scale or scaly. And so it can refer to uh, many different ailments, but um, because of the lack of medical advan advancements, they described sicknesses of the day by what they saw. And so they would describe a, sin a skin disorder as uh, leprosy. So this was a very common problem in Israel. Um, we find out in Leviticus chapter 13 that there were laws on how to deal with the disease, how it was to be diagnosed by the priest, how it was to be cared for. And... Uh, Leviticus 13, verses 45 through 46, it says, As for the leper who has the infection, his clothes shall be torn, and his hair of his head shall be uncovered, and he shall cover his mustache and cry, Unclean, unclean. He shall remain unclean all the days during which he has the infection. He is unclean. He shall live alone. His dwelling shall be outside the camp. So these ten, they are outside the camp. They are moved pushed out of society. Um, they have this, this condition that is, uh, at times, um, these conditions would be painful, difficult to deal with. Um, this was, uh, you know, uh, if you're looking at um, leprosy of today, it would have started as a white or a pink spot on the skin, spread from that spot, be passed through contact, and um, even through touching something uh, or touching someone, it would would pass, you know, it would be transmittable. Um, terrible disease, which nerves are attacked, um, often started on the head, causing eyebrows to disappear, affected internal organs, usually presented itself through um, the extremities, nerves would be killed, and cause the individual to have no feeling in his hands and feet. And usually, the lack of uh, sensation in their hands and feet would cause the damage to those extremities. So these people, on the outside of society, now awful looking, right? They probably carry with them a certain stench. There's, um, uh, could the, the attack can even um, happen on their larynx, making their voice wheezy. It can cause a foul odor. Um, and in the advanced stages, they could lose a hand or a foot. And so serious condition picture here, gross condition. condition. And I think... What we see as this this um, this exchange happens between Jesus and these men, as you see the the um, uh, 
a picture of what sin looks like before we come to know Jesus. We're detestable, we're gross, we're outcasts, we're separated, we're on our own. These people, no longer able to be with their families uh, on the outside of society, no longer able to go into um, the temple, no longer able to worship, they're separated from uh, their people religiously, they're separated from their families, the stuff that they have often is burned, destroyed, or then as they're kicked out of society, someone else takes control of their possessions. And so they're, they're destitute. They're, oftentimes these people are beggars. This was a horrible, a horrible thing. So they're supposed to be put out of the camp. This is a um, uh, terrible thing, right? Um, no connection to anyone in society. Never able at that point to fill their spouse's embrace if they've contacted, contracted this disease. No longer able to play with their children. This is a this is a big deal. They're separated. They're on the outside. So not only do they suffer physically, but there's also spiritual and uh, social suffering. And uh, leprosy in in the um, the Jewish mind it is often associated with sin. In the Bible, the Levitical law had a way to test for and cleanse someone from having leprosy. And uh, here it is um, also associated with someone who is unclean if they're put on the outside. Um, that's usually what they would say. It's another's approach, right? They would let them know that they are unclean, covering their mouth. When someone was diagnosed with leprosy, it was, all, it was the end for them, right? Separated from everything. This is the condition of the sinner. Separated from God, you are separated from everything. All of his blessing, his declared righteousness, the, the holiness that he can give, the atonement, the, the sin covering, apart from Jesus, you're on the outside. And so here we see the, the lepers on the outside. And we see what they do. They stand at a distance to meet Jesus. It was unlawful for them to be close to someone who was unclean, right? So they would be breaking the law if they stepped over that, whatever that meant to be close to someone. <coughs> and so they call to Jesus, and they say, Jesus, raise their voices, verse 13, and saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. These men, they knew two things. They knew that Jesus had the authority and the power to be able to help them. Number two, they knew that they needed his mercy. They called him master, emphasizing Jesus' power. They had known of his reputation. They um, asked Jesus to show them mercy. What is mercy? What is mercy? It is undeserved favor. They realize they don't deserve this favor, but they ask for it. Closely associated with grace, which is God giving you what you do not deserve. Mercy is not getting what you do deserve. So these um, these lepers were asking Jesus to heal them. They knew that they were helpless on their own. Right? This becomes a reminder for us. A reminder that we were spiritually sick. In the sense of uh, in that sense we were desperate. These men, they are in a situation of desperation. They're crying out for mercy. And this is a picture of sin. It, it leaves us helpless, in need of rescue. This is us before Jesus. My children, they regularly come to me and after they have an injury, some kind of, you know, they, they bump their knee or something, they bump their head, something happens. And the, the fix the fix it to the situation is, for the younger ones especially, it's a band. Band-aids fix everything. So all you need is a band-aid, right? So they ask for a band-aid, and in their mind, they're thinking, oh, this is a cool sticker. It's going to fix my problems. And often they ask for band-aids, and what they really need is some other form of care. You've got a bruise. A band-aid's not going to help. I don't care. I need a band-aid. <laughs> That's the way it is. These lepers, they were asking for help, but it wasn't to address their real need. 
unfortunately, there are many inside and outside the church that are addressing their real need with these band-aids. We often focus on the wrong issue. The world wants to uh, focus on behavior modification, wants to focus on how we act, without addressing the real issue of needing a heart transformation. Right? <coughs> We're going to do whatever we need to do to look good in front of other people. While at the same time, we do not have a, a solution to the way that we look before God. Even those who have put their trust in Christ often fall back into old habits, right? <coughs> you ever been there? I've been there. Falling back into old habits. Feeling like there's something that I, I need to do. We're so easily um, tempted to focus on the external. And so this morning we see these men who are a picture of sin in their um, destitution. And we see what, what they recognize about Jesus. And then secondly this morning we see that we shouldn't become distracted by physical blessing. Jesus does an incredible thing here. Verse 14. When he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they were going, they were cleansed. And Jesus shows compassion on these men, telling them to go and show themselves to the priests. This was in accordance to the law. So um, you can picture these priests, right, as they're going back to the... Um, as the, as the lepers are coming in, they're saying, all right, we have leprosy, and they're explaining the story, and the priest and Jesus, they kind of clash a little bit, right? I wish I could have been a fly on the wall to see this conversation, but oh, here's, oh, I got another buddy, he's coming behind me. Oh, wait, there's actually seven more behind him, and, and so they're, they're having to go through these priests as they're um, doing this ceremonial cleansing, checking them, making sure that they are uh, free of this condition, and uh, all the time, they're giving this testimony, this is what Jesus did, he healed us, and so um, they're, they're, they're uh, expressing faith in the, the response that they give. Jesus um, shows this blessing to many in different ways. He recognizes the needs of the people. And um, Jesus gives this common grace to these ten lepers. He shows grace to them. He shows mercy to them, displayed through this interaction. But in this interaction... There is a, a revealing of the heart of these people. When we get what we want, what is our response? There are two types of lepers in the story, right? I keep saying the word leper, and I'm very careful not to say leopard. <laughs> <laughs> two types of lepers in the story. Those who knew about Jesus' power and trusted his ability to help them received the blessing that he provided physically, but they did not recognize the blessing and the healing that he provided spiritually. Nine of these lepers were enjoying the good things from Jesus, but they did not stop to enjoy Jesus. They did not stop to enjoy Jesus. It's like uh, parents who have been blessed with children or a spouse or someone that they care for. And we can be so thankful and grateful for that loved one, for that individual, that we begin to worship that individual and we worship the time with them rather than worshiping our time with God. Recognizing our time with God rather than worshiping God himself, right? When we, what happens then is if we lose them, then our lives fall apart because our focus has so elevated them on that pedestal that now the world crumbles, right? The same could be true of a job. It's, oh, this job, this is so special to me. It is wonderful. And then you lose it and you're like, oh, what's the point of my life? It could be the same for a position, a possession, a hobby. The things of this world are quickly passing. But our love and adoration, our worship of God, it continues from now and into eternity. As someone who has put their faith in Christ, our identity is in Him. We are who we are by His grace. Unfortunately, we can begin to get focused on the things that God does for us, and we can forget about God Himself. 
think this can be best illustrated at times through the way that we pray. Often our prayers are filled with requests, right? What we want God to do for us, and they lack adoration and praise. They lack gratitude for God himself. You know, our worship isn't based on what God does. Now, it can help us understand who he is, and it can and influence and um, affect the way that we come before him. But it's not, it should be based on what he does. Our worship is based on who he is, right? <coughs> and if our worship is based on who he is, then we can worship him when the times are good and when times are bad, right? And so what he does to teach us about who he is um, is, a, is a story of this these ten lepers. And um, we've got to be careful that our our stories of God's blessings can um, that they don't eclipse our praise or our worship or our gratitude for God Himself. Um, we don't need a story of God's blessings in order to talk about or worship Him, right? Things that He does for us should only compel us further to respond as this one leper does. The things that He does for us should not be about us, right? We worship those things or the blessings. What we're doing is we're, we're focused on us. This is a good thing for me. And so I'm so thankful for this thing that happened to me. And I'm going to focus on this blessing. And I'm going to say, oh, thank you for this blessing. But we're going to miss out on the one who gives the blessing. The blessings that God gives to people are not about the people, right? They're about him. That's why he does what he does. We were created to worship. Not when we get our way. We're created to worship. Not when God does cool things for us. Not when he blesses us. But worship is something that should be done unconditionally. It is because who he is. And he does not change. And therefore our worship should be con consistent. I went back and forth with a couple of fellows this week trying to Help them understand the, the importance of um, worshiping God. They were asking me, what, what is the point to life? And I went back and forth, and I was trying to explain to them how the point to life is worship and service. And service could even be looked at as a form of worship. So it's all about worshiping God. And in the, in the communication, they, they kept bringing up what they were supposed to do or the way that, the, that this life was for them and what they were trying to achieve. And they were saying, I need to do this and that, and I have to make sure that I can attain this thing, and they kept putting these different roadblocks in the place of just enjoying God. The third thing that we see here, verse 15, we need salvation from God. This is our greatest need. The one who returned, he was alone. A little application here. Most people want God's blessings without wanting God. The world desires to live prosperously, desires to have health, long life, desires to be successful. They don't really want to give God the authority over their lives. They want a small God. Or obey him. And I know he I really need something they make a wish they go on the other land and they wish for him. Oh God, give me a big baby boy. Right? This one who returns, he's alone. And then there's only one who returns and he, his return it, it demonstrates his faith. He responds in three ways as he comes back. And verse 15 continues. It says, Now one of them when he saw that he had been healed, he turned back, glorifying God with a loud voice. And he fell on his face at his feet, giving thanks to him. He glorified God with a loud voice. And it's interesting to think about. This is possibly a voice that he did not have before being healed. He glorifies God. He praises God. He acknowledges the weight and the splendor and the greatness of God. Let me just 
stuck another little piece of application in here, don't be afraid to let others hear what God has done for you. Right? Don't be afraid to let others hear what God has done for you. It is it is not a, a worship of the thing whenever you're praising God for that thing, right? And so you praise him in the communication of the thing that he's done for us. Secondly, this one, he falls on his face at his feet. He takes this posture of humble submission. He was worshiping God. Wait, I thought this was Jesus. No. It's God. Jesus is God. He's glorifying God with a loud voice, it says in verse 15. The third thing that we see is that he gives thanks to him. Gratitude should be ever-present in our life as we are uh, able to understand more and more of the love of God, the love that he has shown to us. In the darkest of times, we still have gratitude. Our circumstances don't dictate how thankful we are. Right? We're getting ready to go into a season this week. Oh, I'm just so thankful for this, that, and the other thing. It's good to reflect on those things. But it's not just to be relegated to a specific day or a certain week. Right? It is an attitude. It's something that we take with us because we know who Jesus is. It's not an emotion. It is a state of being. And here in this text, we have finally the punchline. And he was a Samaritan. At this point, everybody smacks their face and they're like, what? In the world is going on? A Samaritan? Uh, a half-breed? What in the world? It's the Samaritan that goes back to Jesus? It is a Samaritan that goes back to Jesus. Isn't it interesting that Jesus tells the ten to go into the tem temple and the Samaritan was like, hey, no, 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 go, no, go, get out. Go off. I'll obey. He realizes he's cleansed, and he's like, what, what am I doing? I'm like, I need to go back to Jesus. What you see here is evidence that anyone can come to Christ. It's not about making your life clean first, getting everything in order. It's not about having more good deeds than bad deeds. It's not about making sure that you are wearing the right attire or speaking the right kind of lingo. God desires that you come to desires that you come to him. The one who returned recognized that Jesus gives both physical and spiritual healing. Verse 17 continues, Then Jesus answered and said to him, Were there not ten cleansed? But the nine, where are they? Was no one found to return to give glory to God except this foreigner? Again, Jesus declaring himself God. No one to return except this foreigner? And he said to him, stand up and go. Your faith has made you well. Jesus answers and gives this terrifying lesson. These nine, they're on their way to the priest, and they, <coughs> they got what they wanted out of Jesus, and then they left. No one returns except this foreigner, Jesus says to him. This foreigner. This is the only, uh, in this text, this is the uh, only place this term is used in the New Testament. Josephus, a Jewish historian, recorded that there was a sign on the wall outside the inner court of the temple saying, No foreigners allowed. There's some irony here, isn't it? The irony here is that the other nine went to the temple to be ceremonially cleansed while the foreigner was at the feet of Jesus being made spiritually clean. He says, stand up, go. Your faith, literally translated, has saved you. The Greek word there is sozo to save, to preserve. Used elsewhere in the New Testament as salvation. Jesus is saying that because of this man's faith, he has been saved. This 
this response is the response of someone who recognized who who Jesus is. And so this morning, as we think about this next week, as we prepare our hearts to be thankful, we should always be thankful, right? And so as you go into this next week, maybe one of the things that you can try to think about, keep in the front of your mind, is who God is. You can be thankful that you know him, and knowing him, that you can worship him. The question comes up, you can ask yourself this question today, you can ask yourself this question this week, do you cherish Christ, or do you cherish blessings? Do you cherish what he can do for you? What he can give you? I think this morning, the first where it all starts, right? The first question is, have you put your faith in Christ for your salvation? Have you come to him as this one leper did, expressing faith in Jesus? And Jesus is able to make him not only physically clean, but spiritually clean. No longer is this leper on the outside. No longer is he an outcast. to know who Jesus is. Hebrews 11.6 says, And without faith it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. This leper saw him, and he found him. And that began his journey in the relationship that he has with God. Father, we are so thankful that you give us this picture of salvation through redeeming and rescuing the the most outcast person and bringing them near. Father, I thank you that by faith you have brought us near. Father, I thank you that this morning we can acknowledge and rejoice in who you are. We can rejoice in seeing the things that you've done, and we can give all the glory and the credit to you. Father, I pray that you would help us. Help us when we find ourselves tempted to appreciate the blessing instead of recognizing you. Father, help us when we're tempted to think about things in terms of what the world finds important, what the world is thankful for, what the world finds satisfaction in. God, help us not to fall into that trap. God, we know that you alone are worthy of our worship. Help us to live in such a way that is exemplary of that. God, I thank you for loving us. I thank you for giving us the opportunity to know you. I thank you that you make a way for us to be saved from our spiritual, sinful condition. Thank you for your grace and your mercy. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.